While visiting Airtex, I had the opportunity to hang out with their director of engineering, Kurt Ullum, who was kind enough to show me some of his cool toys. Okay, this is an example of one of our external chiller units. Uh, the primary purpose of these units is to run chilled coolant through the test system. And the uh, reason for that is we do have to try to maintain 75 to 80 degree Fahrenheit fuel temperature consistently during the entire duration of the test. So anytime we're running a test, we're going to be constantly running the chiller units to keep that temperature controlled. Some people may ask why we only test at 75 to 80 degrees because different parts of the country see much higher temperatures. This particular building does standard durability. We have a special building that we can do elevated temperature testing in. And if we need to go up to 150 to 200 degrees, we can. The equipment you see there at the back of the building, that's our power supplies for this building. All the test equipment is housed in the facility. Uh, we keep all the electronics in here. Uh, if we have a problem with a piece of test equipment, it shows up here. The technicians can monitor everything from the, this room. It's also where they write up their test reports and enter all the data into the data system. So, in addition to that, we do program these test units to run for certain on-off periods of time, and that's all also done on this large control bank. What I was talking about earlier, if you notice up in this corner, and the corner back here, you see the spectrum, light spectrum analyzing equipment. Uh, in the event that we have a spark, certain frequency on the light spectrum, it automatically sets the sprinkler systems off, and it automatically not notifies the local fire department. The general rule, though, what we're doing in this building is strictly gas in this room. We're running standard durability, anywhere from 100 hours to 10,000 hours, depending on what the customer requires. A lot of our OEM customers, such as Caterpillar, may require 10,000 plus hours. Depending on the type of test, we can run in a different, different alterations, different uh, fuel mixes. You can see here we've currently got E10 in this tank, standard unleaded in the two bottom tanks. We may be running E85 next week for a specific test. Uh, we can fit 25 pumps at a time in each one of these drawers. And as I mentioned earlier, the frost you see here is the coolant lines that actually run in these tanks help keep that fuel temperature at about a constant 75 degrees. So in this particular cabinet, we can get 100 pumps in here at one time. Each of these external frame units, we can fit about 48 pumps on each one of those. And again, they're going to run for a specific time period, anywhere from 100 to 10,000 hours. We're also going to control the duty cycle, so many minutes on, so many minutes off. Also, for reference, we do have to change the fuel out every 72 hours. Uh, the physical properties of fuel under continual test conditions tend to break down. So to keep our test as consistent as we can, we change the fuel out completely in all these buildings every 72 hours. What do you do with the old stuff? Put it in your car? It goes back to the dealer's and bulk distributor. <laughs> they take it back to the terminal and then it gets reformulated back into a regular stock. Don't currently have anything on uh, the diesel stand. This stand is used primarily for diesel testing. And it's arranged in a Christmas tree configuration so we can put larger fuel modules in place for testing. As far as the concept, it's set up just like the other testers, the fuel tanks are on the bottom and the coolant lines to keep the cool temperature are coming from overhead instead of from the side. Basically the same setup, but it's intended for use with larger parts. And we can fit uh, roughly 98 on this thing. We bring in all of our test fuel from an outside storage facility underground actually bring it up inside the building. That way in the winter time, whether it's 10 below zero or it's a nice balmy day, the technicians don't have to go outside. Plus we have EPA regulations we have to perform because we can't spill anything into the outside drain system. This building is primarily for module testing. 
And when you, when you say module testing, what do you mean by that? Okay, as opposed to a pump only, this, if you see these units on the floor, this would be the whole in-tank module fuel assembly. It goes inside the customer's fuel tank. So we have a separate facility for testing pump onlys, and this facility is basically regulated to testing the whole in-tank module itself. So the test tanks are a little bit different in size and configuration. Just like in the main building, everything's explosion proof. We've got the light spectrum analyzer in the corner in here, just like we do in the other building. It's all for safety and fire prevention. And here's a good example. Dennis is actually changing the fuel out of this building this morning. And again, that's all being done in the interest of keeping the fuel consistent during the, during the whole duration. Said this again is our bulk fuel storage area. We keep roughly a thousand gallons each of gasoline and diesel at all times, and we do bring that fuel into the main test facility through these underground stainless steel lines again uh, to conform with EPA and environmental regulations. We have a customer that says they want to deal strictly with a uh, oh a special mixture of a high alcohol blend. We would keep the chemicals and the additives that we need to mix with our fuel stored in this building. Most of our testing is done with standard uh, E10, regular unleaded, number one, number two diesel, and so on. Uh, special biodiesel additives and so on will be kept in this extra building as well. The intent basically is to be able to test in any fuel mixture that the customer needs. So if they have special needs, we want to make sure we can accommodate them with our facility. This would be an example of what we do to the pumps after they've completed their standard durability testing. And again, whether they run for 100 hours or 10,000, once they're done with that testing, we bring the parts down here to these technicians. They run a follow-up performance test on the parts, and then they're di uh, disassembled component by component. We're going to be looking for things such as signs of excessive or premature commutator wear, Wear on the pumping section parts, maybe due to abrasion or a, a material that's not robust enough. We're going to be evaluating all the plastic and elastomeric parts to make sure that they haven't had any kind of deep con uh, decomposition or damage during the testing process. If the pump passes the flying colors, we know we've done our developmental testing properly. Can you tell me what all the different parts I'm looking at are here? You're looking at a combination. Of course, this is uh, the outer shell, which is what most customers don't see beyond this point. Inside that we're going to have the outlet and the brush and terminal holder. As part of that sub-assembly, this is also what we call our magnet shell or our flux carrier. And inside it you can actually see the magnets that surround the armature in the pump. Inside this sub-assembly, the next part that you'll see here is the armature with the commutator that interfaces with the brushes in the pump. Of course, once that's energized with the uh, voltage from the automobile or the truck, whatever the case may be, it turns and rotates, and then it actually turns these pumping elements, which my finger's on right now. This happens to be a roller vane style pump. This is the rotor, which runs inside this cam ring, and uh, during normal assembly, these small rolling elements would be in each one of these pockets. And as that thing rotates, the movement of the rollers is actually what pumps the fuel. So we're going to be really concerned with the state and the condition of the pumping elements when we take a tested pump apart. Now I've, he I've heard people say uh, if you run your tank low for an extended period of time, the fuel pump is exposed to the air rather than being immersed in fuel. And because of that, um, that can help accelerate the failure of the pump. Is that true? Only if it runs completely dry. As long as you're pulling fuel through the pump, it's going to be lubricated and cooled, whether it's in a low fuel condition or a full tank. The main thing is you don't run the pump dry any longer than you have to. Of course, if the, fuel, if the pump is still in your tank and you're running dry, you're out of fuel and the engine's going to quit. So whether the pump's completely submerged or not, as long as you're pulling fuel through the pump, it's going to help cool it and it's going to help lubricate it. So there really is little truth to the low fuel thing. Running out of fuel is what is what the issue the only other thing that's detrimental about low fuel conditions is if you have an old system that's got a lot of contamination in it 
the lower you get to the bottom of the tank and you've got that concentrated layer of fuel, there's going to be more contamination density. So as you keep a fuller tank, you're going to tend to keep more of the, whatever contamination is in there in suspension. So it, it'll be dispersed a lot more rather yeah. than concentrated when it's all Otherwise in a puddle at the bottom of the tank. Let's just say you've only got an inch of fuel left in your tank. Whatever garbage debris you've got in there, now it's kind of in a, in a concentrated area. Okay, okay. And then the other question that I had was, is, is when the pump does fail, uh, is it, are you looking at mostly mechanical failures of the pump or are you looking at more electrical failures of the pump? As a general rule, mechanical failure precipitates an electrical problem later on if it runs long enough. Most of the problems you're going to see are due to mechanical wear, mechanical breakdown. And that would be as a result mostly of contamination. If we, if we do our job right and manufacture the pump right, then in most cases you're going to see the most damage done by contamination. And that is going to manifest itself somewhere in this in guy the, right here? In the actual pumping elements, whether they be metal pumping elements or plastic. So e either either way, most likely it's going to start as a mechanical issue first. And like we discussed earlier, it could be tens of thousands of an inch of tolerance that would be lost that would cause the pump not to be able to be now, as efficient. Two things can happen. Uh, if you get enough contamination in, you can actually lock the pump up. On the other side, if you're passing and digesting and passing through a lot of contamination, you're going to eventually wear the pumping elements down. And once the spacing of those parts opens up, then the efficiency of the fuel pump drops off. Now, a lot of people say, well, fine, why don't you just keep putting on a finer and finer filter? Well, that's fine in principle, but if you're in a heavy enough contaminated system, the finer the uh, media grade of the filter is, the quicker it's going to plug off. And also, would, would that have any effect on the restriction? Well, as, aside from it getting contaminated with material that would cause the, the flow to be compromised, would, would it also something that fine cause a restriction to the pump itself and the make it have to work harder? The more inlet restriction you have, two things happen. And, of course, the one that's most detrimental, if you get enough inlet restriction, it causes the pump to work harder, and that causes the amp draw to go up. Amp draw goes up, you get more heat, you get more electrical wear, uh, degradation of the components like the brushes and the commutator. And you were actually saying that sometimes the contacts would get so many amps going through them that they would actually be able to melt the plastic? If you get into a lockup situation on this pump and you're still drawing power from the system, you can generate enough heat uh, even over a short period of time that you can actually compromise the integrity of the plastic. Myth debunked. Thank you very much. It's impressive to think about the time and effort that goes into AirTech's products. They do extensive testing and research to find out what works and what doesn't. I'm grateful that they allowed us to tour their facility and hope they have us back at some point so we can learn more about this great company and the products they make. Until then, be safe, have fun, and stay dirty.